Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Deborah Fox, and I'm the Artistic Director of NYS Baroque in Ithaca and Syracuse, New York, and Pegasus Early Music in Rochester, New York. We're so glad you've joined us for today's presentation. <clears throat> this season, we've taken the opportunity of having to go online to present not only concerts, but also um, presentations about a variety of musical topics. And today's presentation, Exile and Connection, Stories of Jewish Musicians and Their Contemporaries in Early Modern Europe, will be presented by Rebecca Sipis and Liza Malamut, whom you'll meet in a minute. They're going to be joined uh, on video by the ensemble Incantare, of which Liza is co-director. Incantare is an early music ensemble of which the core instruments are violins, sackbuts, and organ. And to head off any questions right away, let's just quickly discuss the sackbut. It's um, an early trombone. And the word sackbut comes from the French, um, the medieval French sacaboute, which has to do with pushing and pulling. And Cantari's concerts highlight the musical and cultural connections of underexplored musicians from the Renaissance and early Baroque periods, especially music by composers, singers, and instrumentalists from marginalized communities in early modern Europe. The ensemble strives to discover, research, transcribe, teach, and especially perform works that may have not been heard since they were first conceived. The consort of sackbuts and violins has a long history and a unique sound that incorporates the vocal qualities of both instruments while retaining each of their distinct timbres, making it the perfect medium for performing the beautiful works from this rich musical time period. I think you'll agree that the sound is really something quite special. So Rebecca will present first, followed by Liza, and then we'll have time for questions, which you can enter into the YouTube chat or the YouTube comments. Rebecca Sipis is Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Mason Gross School of the Arts and at Rutgers University, and an Associate Professor in the Music Department. She's the author and editor of many books, including Curious and Modern Inventions, Instrumental Music as Discovery in Galileo's Italy, Women and Musical Salons in the Enlightenment, and Sarah Levy's World, Gender, Judaism, and the Bach Tradition in, in Enlightenment Berlin. She's also a performer on historical keyboard instruments and directs the Raritan Players, which is devoted to the exploration of compositions and performance practices associated with women. They've made recordings and they've gotten uh, my favorite review, I think of all time from the American Record Guide, which says, this album could be better only if they could find a way to scent it with freshly baked cookies. Wow, I'd like to hear that after a concert. <laughs> Liza Malamut regularly appears as a trombonist, teaching artist, and presenter throughout the United States and abroad. She's performed with all the major early music ensembles in this country. She's a passionate teacher and researcher, and her work in trombone pedagogy was supported by a fellowship from the American Association of University Women. She's taught at Indiana University and Tufts University and regularly teaches at workshops throughout the country, such as the Amherst Early Music Festival. She's co-editor with Rebecca and with Lynette, Lynette Bowring of a forthcoming book, Music and Jewish Culture in Early Modern Italy, New Perspectives. She holds a DMA in historical performance from Boston University, where she studied a uh, historical trombone or the sackbut with Greg Inglis. Liza is a founding member and co-artistic director of Incantare. So before you meet them and hear the presentation and the music, uh, I just have a little housekeeping. There's a link to the program for today's presentation in your YouTube description. 
You can enter questions and comments in the YouTube chat. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know where you're listening from. Um, and we'd love to take your questions after the presentation. Now, during this pandemic year, as I mentioned before, we've gone online. We haven't been able to do any live concerts. And our boards made the decision to make all of our events online, which is a few more than we would usually do live, uh, to make them all free of charge and not to charge for tickets. However, at the same time, we are deeply, deeply committed to paying our artists their professional fees, as so many artists have lost completely their livelihoods during the pandemic, not being able to perform. So there's a little disconnect there. And we are asking you if you are so moved to make a donation in lieu of buying a ticket, or for the sheer love of music, we greatly appreciate that. And we are very grateful. And please know that in doing that, you are really helping to keep the music coming. So thank you, enjoy the presentation. And now let's go off to 17th century Italy. What you just heard was an excerpt from Salomone Rossi's setting of Psalm 137 from the Hebrew Bible by the rivers of Babylon. This is a well-known text, of course, it discusses music making um, and so was set by many composers, but Rossi is the only composer whom we know of in the early modern period who set it in Hebrew. Um, by the rivers of Babylon, the text goes, there we sat and wept remembering Zion. There our captors demanded that we sing and rejoice with sounds of happiness. Sing for us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the songs of God in a strange land? That last question, how can we sing the songs of God in a strange land, in a way is a question that underlies the whole presentation that we'll be, that we'll be offering you today. Um, this piece again comes from Salomone Rossi's Hashirim Masher Lishlomo, a publication from 1622 to 23, um, meaning the songs of Solomon. And because he was Salomone, um, he's making a play on his name and the name of King Solomon. Um, the question, how, how, how can we sing the songs of God in a strange land, seems to be answered in a way through Rossi's publication. Well, he seems to say, we sing the songs of God in the style of our time and place, uh, meaning Mantua 1622. Since the 19th century, scholars, composers, and performers have pointed to Rossi as a pioneer, right? He was the first to compose and publish original polyphonic music in Hebrew. He called it Musica Ivrit, Hebrew or Jewish music. And he published these pieces, as you see here, this is the title page of the collection, um, you know, in, a, in an innovative way. Um, it's true that these are Jewish pieces, as he claimed, right? They set Hebrew texts, liturgical texts, most of them. However, the, the fact that he set these texts using the style of 17th century Italy, the land of his exile, seems like an inherent contradiction. Rossi was active as a composer and a string player in two worlds both in the court of the Gonzagas and on the streets of Mantua as part of the sort of um, secular, um, even, even Christian oriented community in which he lived, but also within the Jewish community. So he traversed boundaries between these two communities. Um, the fact that Rossi was a composer 
in a way has skewed our understanding of music making in early modern Italy among Jews and early modern Europe more broadly. Um, while Rossi was unique as a composer who notated and published Hebrew music, he was certainly not unique as a musician. Many Jews were active in Italy and beyond as instrumentalists, singers, dancers, dancing teachers, creating a robust culture of musical theater and other genres that were prized both internally within the Jewish community and among their Christian neighbors and listeners. Music seems to have offered professional opportunities to Jews at a time when Jewish participation in many professions was restricted. Um, so there's a paradoxical situation of Jews in Italy, right? While elsewhere in Europe, Jews are at various points expelled from certain lands, and we'll talk about that more in a moment, within the Italian peninsula, Jews are sort of, they're, they're, they're not expelled except from the kingdom of Naples in the mid 16th century, but in um, cities like Venice, Mantua, Florence, um, Jews are not expelled. They're actually inscribed within the landscape of these early modern Italian cities by means of a ghetto that then restricts their movements. So the ghetto simultaneously um, serves to constrain them and also ensure that their presence in Italian cities remained. And they were not, they didn't just live on the periphery of these cities. Actually in most, most Italian ghettos were located in the center of town. So you can see uh, the map here of Mantua. Um, the blue star represents the location of the Jewish ghetto in Mantua, which was completed in 1612. And the red star is the location of the church of San Andrea. So both of these institutions are right at the heart of the city. Um, and Christians would walk by the ghetto and Jews could go in and out during the daytime hours as they wished. Um, so there's that, that paradox that, that the ghetto seems to embody, but that is also, it sort of also extends to lots of cultural practices and institutions, including music. The Jewish presence on the Italian peninsula was composed of many different types of people. Um, Jews are attested throughout the 14th and 15th centuries, though it's difficult to sort of pinpoint, you know, a, a consistent presence for any long period of time. Um, however, these 14th and 15th century communities are primarily Ashkenazic. They're from Central Europe, from primarily from German speaking lands. However, with the expulsion of Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, from Spain in 1492, from Portugal in 1497, there's a new influx of Sephardic Jews, right? Iberian Jews coming from the Iberian Peninsula who settle in Italy alongside their Ashkenazic predecessors who were already there. These Sephardic Jews had extensive trade connections, an international network of family and um, sort of social contacts and business contacts, which enabled them to participate and really contribute to commercial life and business life on the Italian peninsula. And this extended to music as well. So some of the Sephardic Jews who migrated to Southern Italy, especially, were active as, um, as instrument builders, instrument traders. Some of them are even on record um, as having owned enough instruments that it's likely that they were renting these things out. Um, so they sort of served as a, as a focal point for musical instrument culture. Um, so these, again, these Sephardic Jews would have joined the established Ashkenazic population in Italy. And in addition, there were influences from the East, especially from the Ottoman Empire, um, and particularly so in Venice. Venice was a highly cosmopolitan city with many, many different types of people. Um, so there would have been in Venice, um, Ashkenazic Jews, Sephardic Jews, and also Jews from the Ottoman Empire who would have learned the Turkish system of musical modes like called makam um, and used that in their synagogue worship. Um, so these sounds, the sounds of Turkish makam um, would have merged with Sephardic musical traditions and Ashkenazic musical traditions in the Venetian ghetto. You could see a picture of the ghetto today here in this slide. So the situation in, in Italy and also across Europe was really not entirely secure for Jews at all during the modern period. 
Um, so again, I mentioned the Kingdom of Naples in Southern Italy, after first welcoming the Jews who had been expelled from the Iberian Peninsula in the late 15th century, the Kingdom of Naples went on to expel its Jewish population in the 1540s. Um, and the situation in the rest of Europe varied with time and place. Um, the migration of peoples and particularly Jews was a characteristic of early modern existence. Um, so David B. Ruderman, a great historian whose book Early Modern Jewry I recommend very highly, has argued that migration and the spread of ideas was central to the Jewish experience in the early modern era. And so too was the interaction between Jews and non-Jewish, uh, their non-Jewish neighbors, um, which also involved this, the sharing of ideas and cultural practices, including music. So just a couple of uh, cases, one in Central Europe, um, Elia Bacher Levita. Um, so Elia Bacher lived in, uh, in Italy and in Central Europe in German speaking lands. And he sort of went back and forth between the two over the course of his lifetime. Um, so there's evidence that he was, he was involved in different kinds of poetic and musical practices. Um, in Italy, one of the common ways of sharing poetry, um, even today, this is true, is through the use of recitation formulas, musical formulas that are used to recite poetry of a given meter. Um, so Elia Bacher knew about this practice um, obviously participated in it because he wrote Yiddish poetry to be sung to Italian tunes, Italian musical formulas. In addition, he was obviously involved in Hebrew poetic and musical practices as well. And we know this because he published a treatise on Hebrew cantillation, right? Synagogue cantillation called the Tuv Ta'am or the beauty of um, Ta'am is, um, is, is another word for, um, for cantillation. So the beauty of the cantillation essentially. And this demonstrates his immersion in the classical tradition of chanting the Torah and other liturgical texts. Um, while few pitch specific notated musical sur sources survive. So by pitch specific, I mean that um, the source doesn't just describe musical performance, but also tells you particularly which notes are sung using staff notation. Um, so transcribing Jewish melodies using staff notation. Very few such sources survive, but there are a couple. Um, one that we'll show now um, from Central Europe, this is a manuscript that now survives in a library in Munich. Um, this is a volume that it, it's sort of a, a combination of a primer and a little mini prayer book, and it preserves um, songs to be sung at the Sabbath table, right, at Sabbath meals. So one of these songs is called Sur Michelot, the rock from whose grace we have eaten. Um, and uh, so this, this manuscript source, it's an anonymous source, preserves not just the text of Sur Michelot, which is still sung in many traditional homes today, but also this melody for it. So you can see here that um, it doesn't actually use staff notation in the sense that it's missing the five lines or however many lines would be needed to demonstrate you know, exactly which pitches are to be sung here, but it does show the relative height, right? Sort of going up and coming down of the melodic line clearly enough that this tune can be reconstructed. So this is a, a medieval manuscript that clearly preserves um, a, a tune for this Hebrew song, Sur Michel Lo. Now, the fact that this manuscript even exists is evidence of cross-cultural contact because this type of musical notation is not native to Jewish communities or Jewish practice, right? That's clear from the fact that so few sources survive that are like this. But the person who wrote out this manuscript obviously knew how to write staff notation, how to write pitch specific notation, and he used it in this, in this little Sabbath booklet. Um, later in this presentation, Liza Malamut will describe additional sources that attest to Jews' appearance as musicians in unexpected places, um, among these the Tudor court of King Henry VIII at a time when England had officially banned Jews from residing there. 
how did non-Jews experience the sounds of Jewish music, right? I'm claiming that there was a lot of cross-cultural contact involved in the early modern Jewish experience. So how did non-Jews perceive Jews as musicians? The answer is often with skepticism, um, skepticism or bias. So the English traveler Thomas Coriat offers one example. He visited a synagogue in Venice during his travels, travels in the early 17th century. And there he heard participatory practices of the synagogue. Um, so he would have heard the cantor at the front of the synagogue, and he would have heard participants in the congregation kind of joining in or not joining in. Maybe some of them are chatting in between prayers. I don't know if that happened. Um, some of them would have been trained musicians and others of them not. Um, so he experiences this and calls it, he, he, sees, he sees it as disorganized and very crude. And he, he calls it an exceedingly loud yawling an undecent roaring, and as it were, a beastly bellowing of it forth. Now, that's funny, right, to sort of describe, you know, the kind of cacophony that he heard in this way, but it's also a fairly dark characterization, right? This, this is not a neutral choice when Coriat uses the word beastly to describe, um, to describe people. He's, he's comparing the Jews that he heard to animals. Um, and this is characteristic of what one musicologist, Ruth Hakohane, has called the music libel against the Jews. So Hakohane argues that um, many Christians throughout the millennia perceived Jews as inherently unmusical and moreover incapable of making music. And this was often attributed to the fact that they refused to change their religious outlook to accept the Christian savior. So the fact that they were immoral, religiously immoral in the eyes of Christian observers meant that they could never be musical. And yet Jews, Jews did continue to make music. Jewish musicians notated and sometimes published their work. They authored treatises on music theory and history. They grew and expanded upon forms of musical theater. They performed as instrumentalists, singers, and dancers, and they taught those subjects to both Jews and Christians. They performed in private homes of adherence to both religions, and they participated in the rich environment and practice of instrument design and creation. Some of those innovations manifested themselves primarily within Jewish communities, but in many cases, um, influence and collaboration and the discursive counterpoint between Jewish musicians and theorists and their non-Jewish contemporaries can be readily discerned. Such cases of influence and counterpoint range from the presence of humanist theories of music in Hebrew writings to stylized imitations of Hebrew song in musical compositions of non-Jewish composers such as Vecchi and Bancheri. In the discussion and performances that follow, we'll explore music as a site of early modern Jewish identity and cross-cultural contact between Jews and non-Jews. Um, so the videos that will follow in a minute pick up on Salomone Rossi's presence in the city of Mantua. Here in Cantare offers one of his instrumental sinfonie, followed by a sonata by one of his Mantuan contemporaries, Giovanni Battista Bonamente. Thank you.
So the music you just heard demonstrates, um, I think very clearly, the stylistic link between Jewish and uh, Jewish composers and their non-Jewish contemporaries that Rebecca was talking about. And in this specific case study between Rossi and his non-Jewish contemporary Bonamente. So both um, Bonamente and Rossi served at the Gonzaga court in Mantua, and they may have worked with uh, quite a few composers that we have all heard of, um, especially Claudio Monteverdi. They also worked with other composers of Jewish origin, including somebody named Muzio Ephraim, a madrigalist, and several other people who um, I'll discuss a little bit later. Um, and what's really interesting is that a lot of scholars have long thought that Buonamente actually studied violin with Rossi, and both of them certainly cultivated violin music extensively in their region. The Sinfonia and the Sonata we just played, um, they have this clear stylistic link, which, which I just mentioned, but I do also want to note that um, some scholars have pointed out, um, especially our colleague Lynette Bowring, um, she points out that the differing backgrounds of the two composers may have actually played into differences in their composition, compositional styles. According to Lynette Bowering, Rossi's instrumental training would have been purely secular, and, and, and that would have been true. He wasn't exposed to the training that somebody like Bonamente, who was of the Franciscan order, would have received in church music. For example, contrapuntal styles um, sort of note against note um, music that would have been very much associated with sacred polyphony. Um, Rossi's music would have really followed this sort of more secular line of composition, and you can really hear it in the Sinfonia. It bears resemblance to an entrada or an introduction to a secular dance suite, while Bonamente's sonata um, you can kind of hear throughout, you probably heard various contrapuntal techniques, um, repetition and almost fugue-like patterns um, of the opening theme developed throughout the movement. 
So the juxtaposition of these two pieces um, is today's first demonstration of this cultural and musical paradox um, that Rebecca was speaking of. And this paradox existed in Italy and beyond. Artists of these differing backgrounds influenced each other's works. They collaborated together. Sometimes they studied together, but they were also simultaneously quite limited by accessibility um, as, we, as we just said to certain types of training and even sometimes funding. So for example, the Gonzaga court in Mantua was home to Jewish and non-Jewish musicians. They worked alongside each other and they often would collaborate in these very large productions that the Gonzagas loved to put on. And these weren't just your normal uh, music dramas. These were absolutely huge spectacles or spettacoli as they would be called, where you would have theater and music and, um, dance and sometimes even animals, anything you can possibly think of um, to make really the most elaborate show you, <laughs> that you can imagine. Um, and I'd like to just present an example of this where all of these artists might work together um, to put on one of these shows. Um, um, there was a religious drama by Giovanni Battista Andreini called La Maddalena about Mary Magdalene. And this was performed during the wedding celebration for Ferdinando and Catarina in 1617. And as you can see on the slide here, the prologue from this production survives. And it's so fascinating because you can see that it features music from all of these composers who worked together on these productions, including, um, and we'll just sort of flip through these so you can get a very brief look. You can see work by Monteverdi, you can see work by Muzio Ephraim, another Italian composer who is not Jewish, um, Lucese. There's a, another piece by Ephraim. And then at the very end, a piece by Rossi, um, which to me is just the most fascinating of all because of the religious nature of this production. So it was at the Gonzaga court that Rossi formed a concerto of Jewish musicians, a company of Jewish musicians. Um, and he was seen, he and his musicians were, were looked upon very highly by the court. And in fact, they were freed from um, a mandate that um, unfortunately has long been in existence in certain places um, to wear a badge indicating his Jewishness uh, in public. Um, so uh, this was a privilege for him. He could go about a bit more freely than some other Jews in the region. On the other hand, though, Jewish participation in these spectacles was never actually funded by the Gonzagas themselves. It was funded by a Jewish theatrical company that they called the Universita, and they would provide the Gonzagas with this entertainment upon their request. And looking at this you know from a historical distance or, or really in general we can see that this is a very one-sided agreement right the gonzagas ask for entertainment and they say you're going to entertain me but you're also going to pay for it which seems at the outset like not a really great way of doing things but um we do think that this added quite an element of prestige to jewish um, artists it also um, kept really good relations between the gonzaga car uh, court and the jewish population um, and the prestige was really just advantageous and um, precipitated this really nice fluid interaction between jewish and non-jewish artists so the integration of Jewish and non-Jewish musicians through the system provided a means for further stylistic overlap. And this is prevalent in both sacred and secular works. Um, so we're, next we're going to demonstrate this in one of Rossi's motets for the synagogue. And this is from the collection um, that Rebecca mentioned, the Songs of Solomon. Um, and in this case, it's uh, another motet called Shir Hama'alot. And before we play it, I'd like to note that um, Incantare has adapted this uh, liturgical piece to instruments for a concert setting. In a liturgical setting, which it was composed for, the Psalms would have been sung without instruments and by men, um, because 
um, in that specific tradition in Judaism, um, there would not have been instruments um, playing alongside singers uh, in the synagogue for this piece. But because this is a concert version, we um, are adapting the vocal music for instruments, which was actually the substitution practice of instruments um, and voices was pretty common in 17th century Italy. And uh, it's really, uh, it beautifully um, translates to violins, sackbuts. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. So by listening to this piece of music, you can probably already hear that there was stylistic overlap, especially if you're familiar with church polyphony, you can hear those sonorities reflected in Rossi's motet. These congruencies can also be found in secular works. Um, so the next example we're going to present is an instrumental version of the magical Invidioso Amor by Alessandro Striggio. And just a quick note, that uh, this Alessandro Strigio is not the librettist for our Orfeo, but the other Alessandro Strigio, who was a magicalist. So it gets kind of confusing. This is the other one. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, to perform this, we've actually layered the magical with diminutions on the same tune, uh, which and the diminutions were written by Giovanni Bassano. We're going to go into much more detail about the full Bassano family a little bit later, but um, briefly I'll say that they are largely thought to be Jewish by origin. Giovanni Bassano was a member of the Bassano branch who stayed in Italy. The other branch emigrated to England and um, Giovanni was widely known as a musician. Um, he performed um, at St. Mark's Basilica and likely with uh, the Doge's um, P3. And he wrote a tutorial on diminution, which um, to say it as simply as possible, is the practice of embellishing a simple tune. And we don't really know if uh, Giovanni Bassano or Strigio ever met. 
Um, although a lot of Strigo's music was published in Venice, um, so you never know, right? But his madrigals, in any case, became the basis for quite a significant amount of this diminution writing. Um, and the tutorials for performing diminution um, be, were published uh, throughout the Italian peninsula and, and throughout Europe. Um, the height of Strigio's career found him in the services of the Medici in Florence, but his connection with the Gonzaga court also probably brought him into contact with these Jewish and converted musicians that um, performed in Mantua. So just to explain uh, what you're going to hear, um, in the video that follows, we are going to begin with the ensemble playing the unornamented five voice magical by Strigio. After this introduction, Alice is going to perform Bassano's diminutions on the violin over Strigio's unadorned parts, which the ensemble will continue to play. And this creates a really beautiful juxtaposition of the two styles of playing.
So as mentioned, the Bassano family had two branches, one in Italy and one in England. And um, those of you who are fans of uh, Pegasus in New York State Baroque probably know Dang Yang An, who in addition to being a wonderful violinist has also done a lot of work on the Bassanos. And she's mentioned that um, Henry VIII was willing to overlook the Bassanos' Jewish origins because of their talents as musicians and instrument makers. And in addition, a lot of scholars have noted that part of this tolerance may have also stemmed from the knowledge that Jewish court members um, who would be in very close proximity to a king would not at this time be loyal to the Pope. And therefore, they would not probably plot against Henry after the separation of England from the Roman Catholic Church. In any case, um, the Bassanos thrived in England with their musician colleagues, the Lupos and the Laniers. These three families, Lupo, Lanier, and Bassano, were connected both by marriage and by trade. They all served as musicians in England. And in fact, a lot of Bassano women married into the Lupo and Lanier families. Scholars have postulated that both the Bassanos and Lupos had Jewish origins, but especially the Lupos, whose surname, which means wolf, was commonly associated with converted Jews. And the Bassano status as converts, which in England would have been called new Christians, would have allowed them to marry into very prominent families like the Laniers, which in turn would allow them to form these very strong familial ties in addition to their artistic ties. And this would really solidify their integration into English society. And this was actually quite necessary because in spite of King Henry's tolerance, Rebecca's already noted that England was a decidedly unfriendly place for Jews during this time period. However, the court um, provided quite a lucrative haven for Jewish multi-instrumentalists and composers even after Henry VIII's death. And very counterintuitively, this was actually in contrast to Venice, especially during the early 16th century. We think of Venice as a very opulent place um, and a, a place that's very um, friendly to wind instruments. And this was true, but in the early 16th century, unfortunately, it was very unstable and budgets were getting cut even at the St. Mark's School and it was a very um, unstable place to work and live as a musician, even if you were one of the best. So um, the following videos, we're going to present music of Hieronimo, or in England, Jerome, Bassano, and Nicholas Lanier. So by this time, around mid-17th century, the Bassanos and the Laniers um, had been in the English courts for several generations, and likewise their musical styles had evolved as well. Lanier was more known for his secular songs, but he also wrote um, some pieces for just instrumentalists, and in this case, his Sinfonia for two violins um, exemplify this type of incidental music that may have been played either on its own or possibly grouped into this larger um, suite for court events, perhaps. They're formed very interestingly, um, if you remember the Rossi Sinfonia from earlier, um, it recalls that form and it was likely used for the same purpose that Rossi Sinfo uh, Sinfonia was used. The second piece um, that will follow immediately after is a Fantasia for Unspecified Instruments by Bassano. Um, although, even though when we look at the score, it doesn't give the actual instruments that were used, it's just completely unmarked and we sort of have to figure it out by the clefts and the ranges of the notes. Um, we do also know that it was probably performed on vials originally. That's because the vial concert became quite popular during this time period, especially in the Tudor court. Um, and the consort itself, the specific one that was in the Tudor court, um, was populated by quite a few musicians of Jewish origin, including Jerome Bassano. The piece itself, uh, I love it. It is just wonderful to play. It has this very vocal quality and it's very idiomatic for trombones and violins, um, which would be an instrumental substitution that would have been acceptable both in England and in Italy during this time.
Okay, well, we are going to end today's program with a dance. Um, and actually, it's, a, I think, a really great way to sort of exemplify the intercultural connections between Jewish musicians and their non-Jewish contemporaries throughout Europe. Dance was a secular medium, and as such, it was a genre that welcomed Jewish musicians and teachers as well as non-Jewish musicians and teachers. And a few of the um, musicians who became involved in this became quite renowned. Um, and uh, in fact, I'd like to read a quote by um, a scholar um, from our book. Um, his name is Drew Stephen, and it's just so fascinating. So I'm just gonna read it to you. He observes that by the second half of the 15th century, Jewish musicians and dancing masters were active in nearly all Italian territories where Jews lived and were credited with introducing a dignified form of dance that Christian patrons and the nobility found appealing. And he notes further that dance provided this very important conduit for contact between Jews and Christians, and it created this whole other path for cultural exchange. So as a result, quite a few dancing masters um, of Jewish origin became quite well known, especially Guglielmo Ebreo, who uh, was quite a polymath. He taught dancing lessons, he published dance treatises, he choreographed and organized these huge productions that we talked about in the courts of Italy. Um, he even painted, this is a temper on wood that is actually attributed to him. So naturally the popularity of dance engendered this development of the forms by Jewish composers. Unlike the music that was used in sacred venues, um, for example, the motet, maybe the anthem, dance forms presented no barriers whatsoever to Jewish musicians and composers, and they excelled at it. Um, so to demonstrate this, we've actually um, fashioned a dance suite which combines movements by several Jewish and non-Jewish composers. And you can hear in their juxtaposition the real sophistication um, that Jewish composers were able to lend to this medium and which in turn really influenced their non-Jewish contemporary um, composers. So we'll start off with a pavan and a galliard by Augustine Bassano of the Tudor court. After that, we'll play a brando by Salomone Rossi of Mantua. And we will end by playing a really exciting finale, um, originally, uh, excuse me, originally by Giuseppe Sanzi, which was then adapted for instrumental dance band by Gasparo Zanetti, and it's called La Mantovana. And I do want to make a quick note about La Mantovana before we play this music for you. You might recognize the tune. It is widely used even today, but in 17th century Italy, it was very, very popular. Sort of like Strigio's Magicals, it was adopted a number of times for many different types of ensembles and settings. But for the purposes of our program, the most notable is as the melody for the traditional Passover prayer for the dew or Lech Le Shalom Geshem. And this was likely sung in the Spanish synagogue in the Venetian ghetto. So before we play the entire dance suite for you, I'd like to play just a short audio clip of this traditional prayer. Lech le shalom geshem uva ve shalom tal ki rav le hoshia umorid atal Ashir shirati ve asim divrati ve agbira sefati le tsur yeshuati uve yo now we hope you enjoy the full dance suite ending with the dance version of La Mantovana.
Thank you so much, Rebecca Sipis and Liza Malamut for being here today with us and sharing this music and your knowledge and passion for it and its context. And thank you so much to the members of Incantare as well. Alice Kulin Ellison, Cynthia Black Violins, Liza Malamut, Ben David Aronson and Garrett Lahr on Sackbutts and Naomi Gregory playing the organ. Thank you also to Walter Freeman for his incredible tech help and to Lydia Becker for working the YouTube chat. So in a minute, we will uh, take your questions and comments and uh, Liza and Rebecca will come back on and um, we'll have a little discussion with your questions. So please do feel free to enter them in your YouTube chat or in the um, YouTube um, comment area. Uh, However, in the meantime, I just would like to reiterate that we are grateful if you'd like to make a donation today to either of our organizations in support of our programs. Uh, and oddly enough, here's a slide with the websites on and that'll also be in your chat. Um, we really rely on our audiences to keep us going during this pandemic. And um, thank you so much. You have, you have kept us going for sure. And we hope we'll be back with both live and virtual performances next season. Okay, so let's go to some questions. Um, and welcome back, Rebecca and Liza. I have a few questions here. Um, Rebecca, let's uh, get to this one that came up uh, as well last time and came up um, offline for me, um, somebody asking about um, some of these music manuscripts were with Hebrew text. And we saw uh, some images of that, but Hebrew was written from right to left and music is written from left to right. So how does this work, please? Right, thank you for that question. So um, we did get this question before and so we have a slide all prepared here. Um, so I, I don't know how well you can see that, but on the left, you'll see um, a page from Salomone Rossi's Hashiri Masher Lishlomo, which we've referred to a couple of times here. Um, and the way that, that that print, right, it's a, a printed edition works is that the, the music does indeed proceed from left to right as it would normally proceed if the text had been written in Italian or Latin. Um, however, you're right, Deb, that Hebrew is written from right to left. And so it creates a little challenge for, it's really a, a typesetting challenge more than anything else. Um, so the way that Rossi solves that problem, Rossi and his printer solve that problem, um, was to write a series of notes with no text underneath it. And then at the very last note of the series of notes where that word is supposed to appear, that single word appears printed from right to left at the end of the line of notes going from left to right. So in a way, the music and the text are running in opposite directions. And then you leapfrog over the next series of notes to find the Hebrew word that's supposed to cover the, that bun bunch of notes. And then you leapfrog again to get to the next Hebrew word and so on. Now, the two sources on the right side of this slide show a different strategy, right? The top picture there is that, um, that Munich manuscript that we looked at before. And just underneath is another printed piece. This is actually an excerpt from Benedetto Marcello, the 18th century Italian composer um, who also lived in Venice and went into the Venetian ghetto and sort of heard some of the, the, the tunes that were, being, um, that were being sung there and transcribed them. So this is from his book, Marcello's book called Lestro Poetico Armonico, which includes many Latin psalm settings. However, here you can see that he includes also some of the Hebrew tunes with Hebrew texts. Um, this actually, this printed, this little printed um, tune on the bottom of the page on the right is um, the text is Maos Tzur, not a psalm actually, but a famous Hanukkah song, um, the text of which is still sung today. Um, some people still know, will still know this tune today. Um, but anyway, the, the, these two slides, the Munich manuscript and the Marcello source from 1723, 
I think 23, 24. Um, these actually take both the music and the Hebrew text and print them or write them from right to left. So the entire page reads like a mirror image of the way that the music would run if it were if it were printed using conventional right Roman Roman font or you know Latin or Italian or English words. Wow! Thank you, Rebecca. That um, I was just thinking I should practice reading from right to left and playing notes that that could be so interesting. <laughs> okay, um, we do have a question from Cassandra about diminutions. Uh, were diminutions added to vocal performances? If so, were they generally sung as an additional vocal part or played by an instrumentalist? This is such a great question. I love this question. The answer is yes. <laughs> Um, there were many different ways that diminutions could be performed. So um, the basic um, strategy is you have this simple line of text. If you are a vocalist, you could improvise this yourself just as a solo, maybe by simply ornamenting what you already have. Just you, maybe you and a continual player. But there are a lot of options for what you could do, um, especially when you have sort of larger settings. Sometimes they would um, sing in octaves. So you would have the unornamented line either sung or played by instruments, and then you would have a discant singer perhaps ornamenting on top of that. Conversely, you could also have the singers doing the piece unornamented, and, and maybe an instrument ornamenting on top of the singers. And a really great source uh, for this would be Pretorius's um, Syntagma Musicum, which describes myriads of different ways that you can combine instruments and combine instruments and singers and double and play things at the octave, play things at the fifth. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and I could talk about it for days, um, but uh, the short answer is, you could do it many, many ways, and uh, a lot of them would be correct. Yes, it was an excellent question in that it, it, it's about uh, all of what we're studying <laughs> and playing. So thank you, Cassandra. Um, okay, uh, Rebecca, I was interested in something you said um, about there being Jewish instrument designers and and instrument builders. How do we know that? Or can you tell us about that a little bit? Yes, indeed. Um, I learned a lot about this because um, the book that Liza and I are co-editing together with our colleague Lynette Bowring contains a wonderful chapter by an Italian scholar named Luigi Sisto. So I will, I will both cite him and also um, encourage everyone was interested to keep an eye out for the book uh, Music and Jewish Culture in Early Modern Italy, which will be published um, in spring 2022. So less than a year from now, these things sometimes take a long time. But anyway, um, Luigi Sisto has gathered a great deal of information. Um, specifically, he's interested in um, musical instrument builders, um, luthiers in particular, so builders of lutes, violins, viols, um, in the kingdom of Naples in particular. Um, and he's gathered a lot of information about that generation between the expulsion of Jews from Spain and Portugal in 1492 and 97 respectively, and then the expulsion of Jews from the kingdom of Naples in 1544. Um, so the Kingdom of Naples was under the rule, the ha sort of Habsburg rule, along with, am I saying that right? There's a connection between the, between the Iberian Peninsula and the Kingdom of Naples, so that there's a, a migration route from the Iberian Peninsula to southern Italy. Um, so among the, um, the names of uh, instrument builders and instrument traders whom Luigi Sisto has identified as having Jewish surnames. Um, there's um, Giovanni Tommaso Mattino. Mattino was a name that was often associated with converted Jews. So people who had, maybe they were crypto Jews or Muranos, or they had, maybe they had truly converted. Um, Antonio Catalano of Palermo, um, Luigi Sisto also mentions as having a surname that has Judeo-Spanish origin. Um, and he's another, so he's another luthier who apprenticed in a Neapolitan um, workshop, right? A, a luthier workshop. Um, then there is the case of Matteo Sansone, who, um, when the Inquisition raided his home, 
as they did, they created an inventory of his belongings and that they confiscated. Um, and among these were 15 instruments from the violin family, as well as a keyboard instrument and several viole da gamba um, and many music books as well, along with um, books of literature, for example, by Petrarch and Ovid. Um, so he was obviously, Matteo Sansone was obviously a very highly educated person. Um, but the fact that he owned so many of these instruments suggests that he was not, he wasn't just collecting them to play all 15 violin family instruments himself, right? It's likely that he used these things, um, possibly lending them or renting them out to other musicians. This is Sisto's um, argument. And um, what's interesting about that, whether these, whether these instrument builders and traders retained their Jewish identity or whether they chose to convert for maybe truly spiritual reasons or just for practical reasons to kind of avoid the, um, the attention of the Inquisition. Um, the fact is that their Jewish, uh, their Jewish origin would have helped them to, um, uh, to innovate and also spread those innovations in musical instrument design. So the fact that they, they had an international network of connections um, you know, that, that was characteristic of early modern Jewry um, meant that they would have had international and cosmopolitan influences in their instrumental, in their instrumental practices, and also that they would have had business connections throughout the Italian peninsula and perhaps throughout Europe. Um, and this is, you know, so something that I think we think about conversion in a very kind of black and white way. You're either in or you're out. But I think that identity in, you know, sort of religious identity or ethnic identity in early modernity was a lot more fluid and flexible. Um, and that it's possible to believe one thing but profess another openly um, and to, or to adopt a new identity, a new religious identity, but also to continue drawing on um, the kind of social, cultural and um, business connections offered by this pre the previous identity. So these, uh, these cases are really interesting. One other one that I, I cannot imagine doesn't have Jewish origin is the very famous Amati family. And that's because the name Amati um, is a Hebrew name. The, the name means of my people. Um, so it's very difficult for me to see that name and not imagine that that family also, a family which was one of the most prominent violin making families, you know, in, uh, in history alongside Stradiv Stradivari, um, that, that that also was not a name that signifies some kind of Jewish origin. Wow, fascinating. I love uh, what I love about both your research is that you look at the tiny details and then extrapolate out from that about um, what was really going on in history. So thank you for that. Um, uh, let's see, a couple of other questions have come in um, and a comment about instruments. Uh, Tom Borer says, I will put in a shout out for the simbi, which is the hammered dulcimer played by Jewish musicians in Central Europe. The musicians mm -hmm. often played for weddings. Um, and Wonderful. Yeah, so, okay, Brian Taylor asks, were the fantasias performed that were performed by Incantari originally written for five voices? If not, how many? Hi, Brian. Um, thanks for asking that question. Um, yes, they were originally for five voices. Um, and we um, uh, also had Naomi um, play the continual part with us to give us a nice kind of glue to hold everything together. And continuo, just uh, if there's anybody listening who's not sure what that is, is the art of an accompaniment to whatever else is going on. It's improvised accompaniment, usually done by um, keyboard players and lute players as well. So, okay, thank you. Um, and finally, Liza, can you just talk a little bit about the sack butts? I noticed they were different sizes in the videos and also um, tell us where they were made. Sure. Um, so uh, in our videos, you probably saw a combination of tenor, tenor and bass sackbut. 
um, and possibly, if I can recall, alto, tenor, and bass. But these are the the two consorts that as a group we typically use. Whether we use the alto, tenor, bass combination or the tenor, tenor, bass usually depends on what region and time period the music is from. So if we're playing um, music from German speaking areas, we'll often use an alto trombone since that was much more in use in those areas. You don't really see the alto trombone used in Italy really for quite a long time. Um, so oftentimes, even if the, the range of the piece is quite high on the top trombone part, we'll still stick with tenor. Um, for the reason that it would just have been what they would likely have used. Um, as far as where our trombones were made, they're all replicas. Um, mine was made by um, Egger in Basel, Switzerland. Um, ben David's what is from Germany, and I yet again forget what brand, so I think he's on the chat and can write that in there. And uh, Garrett's bass sack, but is a Meinl, which was also made in Germany. And um, super briefly, because it was asked in the last uh, session, I'll just briefly say the difference between um, a sackbut and a modern trombone. They're, they're all trombones. It's just that the sackbut um, is some, a name that we use to differentiate uh, the Baroque uh, or Renaissance trombone from the modern orchestral trombone. It just makes it a little easier to say what we're doing. Um, it's still almost exactly the same instrument fundamentally as it is today. It is the least changed of all Western instruments that we see typically in use. The fundamental or the um, the first position when the slide is fully um, all the way in is the same note um, at A equals 440, B flat, that it would have been uh, 400 years ago. And um, it, uh, it works the same way. Um, we think a little bit differently when we play them. So we often will think diatonically for positions instead of seven chromatic positions. Um, and then the size of the instrument, I'm sure that you notice is different. Um, Renaissance and early Baroque instruments were much smaller um, because their main use was to play with singers either as substitutions for voices or doubled with voices in a practice that was called colaporte. Um, and uh, that's the reason also why the bell is more conical and less flared. It's uh, kind of a warmer sound. It can get a little bit of a more subtle timbre. And um, the mouthpieces, um, I just um, do a brief little, this is a modern trombone mouthpiece. You can see it's quite heavy um, and the rim is, is sort of curved whereas the um, sackbut mouthpiece is a uh, flat rim and a very sharp cup and shank. And um, that was sort of a natural development that happened over time, but that's because the, the sharpness of the mouthpiece helps um, articulation more easily come through where you would want to mimic vocal articulation and syllables more subtly. And when you're playing in a symphony, you just want to be able to play loudly while still playing tastefully. And that's how the instrument developed over time. Great, thank you. And finally, um, I was fascinated to hear that really in all these hundreds of years, things haven't changed all that much and musicians are still facing many of the same issues, including budget cuts. Uh, so just, um, I'm just interested, how does one find out that, the, that Venice was um, cutting its budget for wind players? Uh, in your research, where do, where do you find something like that? Well, um, you can, I guess you can't, you can't say so, sort of like generally, which I might have actually made sound very general, like the city of Venice was cutting its wind budget. The reality of the situation was that prior to, um, I guess it would be 1567, which is when the tenured musicians at, at St. Mark's would have come into play like that, that the St. Mark's musical instrument ensemble, which was led by Dalla Casa, would be sort of mid to late 16th century. But um, prior to that, and really even after that, um, there were very few musicians that were what we would consider salaried or tenured. They really relied on a very similar um, means of performing a freelance um, environment, very similar to what we do today here. Like if you think about if New York City musicians or Rochester musicians, Boston, you know, everywhere, you know, 
we no matter so no matter how great of a musician you are you're sort of at the mercy of whatever institution is currently hiring you so at that time especially in the very early 16th century you would have um you, you have sort of various outlets where you could work you could work for churches you could work for church schools like the school la grande um saint mark's school um hired instrumentalists to teach um and voice teachers as well you could if you were very lucky you would play in um the pifari which was sort of like the city wind band that was the the um the the leader of the city's own ensemble. Um, but none of this was really a sure thing. And you were um, a lot of, especially if you worked at what the Scuola, um, the, the St. Mark's um, school in particular was sort of, um, the budget was at the whim of its leader. And um, those leaders would fluctuate and another one would come in and say, oh, we don't, you know, we don't need half of you. <laughs> Go do something else. Or and then and then a new person would come in and say like, Oh, you know, we're fine, you know, come in. But it, so it was a little, it was a little dicey, even, even if you were great. And, and an interesting, um, comparison there are a couple. Eleanor Selfridge Field writes a lot about who was playing in St. Mark's during this time. Um, and you can also read, um, some information about, um, the English courts during this time by people like Keith Polk and, um, uh, Victor Coelho have written about wind musicians and what they're doing. So at the early, 16th century, if you compare what was going on, the, um, well, let's say, let's say the end of the 16th century, you had six tenured instrumentalists at the Basilica of St. Mark's, whereas at the Tudor court, you had like dozens. There were any, at any time, there were like trombonists alone between nine and 15 regularly employed players. So, the attraction for the Bassanos, you know, to go <laughs> to leave this kind of tenuous situation and then go to Tudor England where Henry was like, I'll give you money. Just just come here. Money, protection. You know, it was uh, I can imagine it being a very attractive concept. Thank you. Yes. Despite the religious tensions. Right. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ben David comments, the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> so true. <laughs> okay, this brings us to the end of our presentation. So thank you so much, Rebecca and Liza, for being here. Thank you to our audience for coming and making such lovely and interesting comments. Um, we hope that you will join us for our next event, which is coming up at the end of May. Um, it's called, it's part of our Young Artists Program, NYS Baroque Young Artists and Pegasus Rising. And we're uh, featuring uh, the new consort, which is a vocal consort in a program that they call, O oh Stars Conspiring Against Me. And they describe it as a meditation on women in myth and how those stories continue to shape the portrayal in women, of women in art to this day. The program is built around the North American digital premiere of a piece called The Turn, which is by an uh, English composer, Ben Roerth. And he wrote it um, based on and designed to be interspersed with a piece by Claudio Monteverdi, who by the way, changed jobs quite a bit as well. Uh, <laughs> um, his uh, Monteverdi's Lamento d'Ariana for chorus or for multiple singers. And they will also perform works by some of Monteverdi's female contemporaries, asking the same questions that we are, the same kinds of questions. So I think that this will be a fascinating uh, presentation, a fascinating concert by a really stellar vocal group. So we do hope that you'll join us. So once again, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Liza and Rebecca, and we hope to see you all next time. Bye-bye.